Hey everyone, Couch Tomato here. Today we're going to be doing something a little different. You might have caught a hint in the opening title, but this is for a game not on PyChess, but rather on our sister site, Lee Shogi, which is like Lee Chess, but dedicated to Shogi. If you're a fan of Shogi or interested in learning Shogi, then we strongly recommend you to check out their site. You can find a link in the description below. Anyways, this video is about Chu Shogi, which means Middle Shogi. It looks big, but there is in fact a big shogi called Dai Shogi, and that's beyond my comprehension. Uh, there's also Small Shogi or Shou Shogi, which essentially became today's standard shogi. Of the shogi variants, this is actually one of the most popular variants, which is why I'm covering the rules today. As you can tell by this large board, there's a lot to cover, and so I'm going to split this into two videos. This video will cover the very basic rules, as well as each of the pieces, and the next video will go into the more complex rules. As you can see by the board here, I'll be using internationalized pieces. These pieces were designed to match the names of the pieces and also incorporate mnemonic devices in the shapes of the pictures whenever possible, which I'll point out throughout the video. This is meant to make this game more accessible to everyone in the world. The game is of course originally made using traditional kanji or Chinese characters. Most traditionally there are two kanji per pieces, but here on the Ishogi, we only offer a more simplified one kanji set, which you can see here. If you'd like to learn with the original kanji, then you're welcome to correlate this video with material online such as the Wikipedia page for Chu Shogi. I'll also be going through the pieces at a quicker pace than my usual videos because it's likely that you'll be using a reference guide, which I'll also provide in the description. Anyways, let's start with the basic rules. Chu Shogi is played on a 12 by 12 board. Each side is defined by the direction that each piece is facing. Sente is the player going first. In this set, that's marked with the black king. Gote is the player going second, marked in this set with the white king. The goal of the game is to checkmate the opponent's king, and if he has one, a prince, but I'll go more into that later. Just like Shogi, there are two promotion zones, but they are the last four ranks instead of the last three ranks. You can still think of them as the first, third, and the last third of the board, also marked by these four stars on the board. Unlike Shogi, a piece that can't move anymore is not forced to promote. So this mostly applies to the pawn, so if the pawn reaches the last rank, it can just stay there and not promote if you choose. Now a major difference between Chu Shogi and Standard Shogi is drops. Standard Shogi is an incredibly complex game because you can drop pieces that you capture. In Chu Shogi, there are no drops, and its complexity comes from the size of the board and the diversity of pieces. So if this game had drops, it'd probably take forever to play, and so that's a good thing. So those are the basic rules I want to discuss. Now let's go over the pieces. Here's a diagram I made of all the pieces in Chu Shogi, and it's to give you an overall roadmap to understanding the relationships between all the pieces. In this set, black pieces are unpromoted while red pieces are promoted. My approach is to think about Pokemon and how each Pokemon evolves from one stage to the next. It's kind of like that, but remember that in Chu Shogi, there are only two sides per piece. So in reality, a lot of these pieces that represent the middle evolution either exist as a starting unpromoted piece, which is the black version, or the promoted form of the piece before it. So for example here, you can see the silver general promotes to the vertical mover. But there's also a basic vertical mover that starts on the board. That black one can promote into a flying ox. Make sense? You can also see that there are two pieces other than the king that don't promote, which are the lion and the queen all the way at the bottom here. But you can still get another one from promotion. So I think putting all these connections together here is more intuitive than memorizing each separate pair of pieces in isolation. Also going back to the silver general, shogi players may notice that the silver general does not promote to a gold general. In fact, most pieces do not promote as they did in shogi, so you'll have to throw away the idea of minor pieces promoting to gold generals. Also, shogi players may notice that there's no knight. There are a lot of pieces here, so I'm going to group them into relatively simple pieces, single step movers, and then the more complex promoted pieces at the end. The really complex pieces gained from promotion are actually pretty rare to see in a game since there are no drops, so memorizing their movements might not be as important as you think. And consequently, you only have to realistically remember a few of these pieces, especially if you come from a shogi background. So let's go over each piece individually now. I'm going to bring up the first four pieces. 
First we have the pawn, which is your most common piece. It only moves one square forward, just like in Shogi. Next we have the go-between. This moves like a pawn, but also goes backward one square. Pretty straightforward. Then you have the lance, straight out of Shogi. It moves any number of squares forward. Then you have the reverse chariot, which is also like the lance, but can also move any number of squares backwards as well. And again, here's one more picture, just with the arrows moved out of the way a little bit so you can see a little better. These next two pieces are called the side mover and the vertical mover, respectively. You can see that the side mover looks like a crab because the crab moves side to side and the snake goes up and down like it goes up and down a tree. So their names basically describe what they do. The side mover moves any number of squares left or right while the vertical mover moves any number of squares up or down. On top of that, the side mover can also move just one square up or down, while the vertical mover can move one square left or right. Now that leaves us with the single step movers. First I'm going to bring up the king, which is of course the most important piece in the game, because if you capture the enemy's king, you win. The king moves like the king in shogi, or or like the king in any other chess game, it moves one square in every direction. As I mentioned before, the black king belongs to Sentai, or the player who goes first, while the white king belongs to Gote, or the player who goes second. Next up we have the metal generals, and for players familiar with shogi, uh, you'll recognize two of them immediately, which are the gold general and the silver general. But on top of that, Chu Shogi introduces the copper general. So let me just briefly summarize. All generals move three squares in front of them, like so. They differ by how they move elsewhere, and so the gold general has a movement like a plus sign, so up, down, left, and right, on top of the three front squares. The silver general is a diagonal mover, so it moves like an X. So these four plus the three squares in front and the copper general is the weakest piece by far, and it can only move one square backwards in addition to the three front squares. So you could try to imagine it as a T. The symbols for these generals are also mnemonic devices. So if you look at the gold general, all the protrusions of the helmet point to where it can move. That's also similar with the silver general as well as the copper general, whereas the little head strap in the copper general points to the one direction it can move to the bottom and they all have headdresses that point to the three squares in front. On top of that, for anyone familiar with alchemical symbols, the uh, gold general also has a sun on the top, while the silver general also has a moon. The alchemical symbol for copper is a little too complicated to naturally integrate into the piece, so you'll just have to work with a simple looking helmet instead. Also, since I have this piece here, this is the token, which is the promoted pawn. Actually, in Choshogi, there isn't really a token, but because it's such an iconic piece from Shogi, I kept the same symbol from the internationalized version of Shogi, so that you know that this used to be a pawn, but it's basically a gold general. Now, finally, we have these three pieces that are named after animals, but are kind of like generals. These three are stronger than the generals because they cover more movement, and so I tend to think of these more as kings that have lost one or two squares of movement. So here I've laid out the movements of the king around each of these pieces, and I'm just going to take away the squares that they can't go to. So our first piece is the blind tiger, and because the tiger is blind, it can't see in front of it, right? So it can't go to that square. Next we have the ferocious leopard. It likes to keep its whiskers on its side nice and protected, right? So it can't go to any of those sides. And then finally we have the drunk elephant. A drunk elephant's so drunk that it can't go backwards, and so it moves like that. So there you have it. The tiger can't go one square forward, the leopard can't go to either square sideways, and the drunk elephant can't go to the square backwards. And actually, finally, before I finish off the step movers, there's one more piece that I need to discuss, and that's the prince. You can only get the prince by promoting the drunk elephant, but when you do so, you get a piece that moves exactly like the king. In fact, it doesn't only move like the king, it basically is a king. So when you get the prince, 
your opponent now needs to capture both your king and your prince in order to win the game. So this is a great piece to have. Alright, let's go on to the next group of pieces. The next two should be familiar to anyone who's played chess or shogi. First is the rook. It moves any number of squares orthogonally, which is up, down, left, or right. Next we have the bishop, which is represented here by this Japanese hat called a kanmuri, which is typically worn by Shinto priests or high-ranking Japanese officials, which is why it's used to represent the bishop here. And just like its name suggests for chess players, it moves any number of squares diagonally. Next we have the Dragon King. In Shogi, the Dragon King was the promoted form of the Rook. Here in Chushogi, the Dragon King is also what you get when you promote the Rook, but you also get two Dragon Kings at the start of the game. So Dragon King moves just like a Rook, but also one square diagonally, or the way I like to think of it is it mixes a Rook with a King. The next piece is called the Dragon Horse, or Horse for short. And similarly, just as in Shogi, it's the promoted form of the Bishop, but you also start with two Dragon Horses at the beginning of the game. And the Dragon Horse moves like a Bishop, but also gains the movement of a King. Or in other words, moving one square orthogonally, in addition to its diagonal movement. Next we have the Kyuding, which is a mythical uh, Japanese creature. You might recognize it from the forest spirit in Princess Mononoke. Anyways, the Kirin is a little more complex. It moves one square diagonally in any direction. And it can also jump two squares orthogonally in any direction. So I'm going to represent that with the color blue for now. So green is where it can step two, and then blue is where it can jump. So if there, but what I mean by jump is if there is a piece in the way, it could still just hop over and get to its destination over there. The next piece is the phoenix, and it's basically the counterpart of the kuning. Instead of moving one square diagonally like the kuning, it can move one square orthogonal. And of course, its jumping is also the opposite of the kuning. It can jump two squares diagonally instead. So these pieces are a little tricky, and the only way I've thought of so far for memorizing this is the phoenix has an X in its name, and so its dominant jumping feature makes the shape of an X, so the phoenix. The next piece we have is the queen, and its symbol is simply a king within a shape that radiates in all eight directions, because the Japanese name is actually a free king. But the English name Queen comes from the chess piece Queen, which moves in all eight directions, any number of squares. Okay, and finally we have the Lion. And the Lion is actually the most important piece in Chushogi outside of the King, and for the most part it's considered the most powerful piece on the board. And the Lion has a very interesting way of moving. It can move anywhere where a King can move, if the King can move twice. So for example, let's start with the initial King moves which are the eight squares around it. Now if the lion moved over here, this grants it access to this area. So it can move there. And if it moved down here, then it can move over there, and then so on and so forth. So it actually covers this whole five by five area of movement. Now on top of that, the lion literally can move twice. So for example, I brought an enemy pawn. So for example, I bought an opponent's pawn over here. The lion can actually kill the pawn and then move somewhere else on the same turn. Or even if it wanted to, the lion could kill the pawn and then go back to where it started as if it hadn't even moved at all. It just ate the pawn. And by extension, if there were two enemy pieces in a row, for example like this, well, the lion can kill two pieces in one turn. This makes it a very deadly piece. Also, with regards to its basic movement, even if the lion were not able to normally move to get to a certain spot, so for example, a lion would normally be able to move to this square, right? Because it's considered two movements. Well, if you treat it as moving twice, then theoretically it should not be able to get there because it's blocked by your pawns over here. But actually, the lion can move anywhere within that 5x5 five five area as if there were no pieces. So it, the lion could essentially jump. So the lion can jump right there and consider that its move. Or similarly, the lion could also jump to there 
or from here to there. So hopefully you could see how powerful the lion is now. Not only can, can it capture multiple pieces in one turn, it can also jump to a whole bunch of squares. So I'd like to say that's it for the lion, but because of its unique movement and uh, capabilities, there are actually a whole bunch of rules that dictate how the lion can move and capture, and I'll just have to save that for the next video. Finally, we have the last few pieces that only exist as promotions. And as a reminder, because these only exist as promotions, these are going to be very rare to see. And chances are you may never see these in a game. So I'm going to start with the white horse and the whale. I have both the lance and the reverse chariot up here just to show that these are the promotions of each respectively. So the white horse being the promotion of the lance, for example. And I like to think of both of these pieces as tridents. So these kind of move shaped like a trident. The white horse moves forwards diagonally and up and down orthogonally, whereas the whale is the opposite. It moves also up and down orthogonally, but backwards diagonally. Now there are a couple of ways to remember this mnemonically. First is how they promote. The lance is a forward going piece, whereas the reverse chariot also gains backwards movement. So logically, the white horse, being the lance's promotion, has very strong forwards movement while the whale, being the reverse chariot's promotion, has the backwards movement. On top of that, the internationalized symbols also have some mnemonic devices, so the white horse's ears kind of show that they move upwards diagonally, whereas the whale's flippers point down or towards the back. So next we'll go into the promoted versions of the side mover and the vertical mover. And these are the free boar and the flying ox, respectively. So I'll just do them one by one. Here's the free boar. Now keep in mind as I'm going through all these pieces, especially the promoted ones, they have these kind of funny adjectives like free boar or flying ox. You can also just refer to them as a, a simple name. Like you can just call this a boar, which I'm going to do from now on. I'm just giving you the full name first just to let you be aware of the original Japanese name. Now for both the boar and the ox, they kind of derive the dominant movement from their unpromoted piece. So since the boar is the promoted side mover, it can go to the side. So it can go any number of squares to the side. And now after that, both of these pieces gain diagonal movement. So this can move any number of squares diagonally. Like this. So it's basically like a queen that just can't go vertically. And even though the side mover can go to these two squares, the boar can't. So hopefully you could figure out what the flying ox, or the ox for short, can do because it's the promoted version of the vertical mover. It can of course move vertically any number of squares. And on top of that, it can move diagonally any number of squares. So it's like a queen that can't move sideways. Now we have the flying stag, or stag for short, and it's the promoted form of the blind tiger. Remember how the blind tiger couldn't move forwards? Well, now it learned how to move any number of square forwards, as well as any number of squares backwards. On top of that, it can move like a king. So you can think of this as a dragon king that can't range sideways. Now finally, we have the promotions for the dragon king and the dragon horse, which are the soaring eagle and the horned falcon, respectively. I'm going to start with the soaring eagle, and bear with me here because these pieces are probably the most complicated in the game. So the soaring eagle is the promoted version of the dragon king, so let's think of it as the Dragon King being an orthogonally based piece, just like the Rook that it promoted from. And so the Soaring Eagle is also going to be an orthogonally based piece. So there is its Rook movement. On top of that, it also has diagonally backwards movement. So it's almost getting to be a Queen. But finally, it has diagonally forwards Lion movement. So like that. So remember how the lion can move in two steps? Well, the eagle could also do the same thing here, but it could only do two steps in this direction. So for example, if there was a piece in this red circle up here, the eagle could capture it and then move back, or it could capture it and move forwards. Or if there are two pieces over here, it could capture both, just like a lion. 
again, the lion movement is only restricted to moving diagonally forwards. So it can't move diagonally forwards and then move sideways any number of spaces. It's just within these two squares only. Finally, we have the Horned Falcon. So this is the promoted version of the Dragon Horus, which is in turn the promoted version of the Bishop. And so this is a diagonally based piece. And so we're going to start off with our diagonal Bishop movement. And on top of that, we're going to give it orthogonal movement anywhere, everywhere else except forwards. And if you can guess by the previous piece, this also has lion movement. And that lion movement is regarding these two squares. So again, same thing. It can capture a piece, come back, or it could capture two pieces, or it could jump two squares forward. And so that's the mighty horned falcon. One more thing I want to point out here is the promotion line for the rook and bishop. And this is another mnemonic device in that the rook promotions all kind of face forward at you, whereas the bishop promotions all face to the side. So that's how you remember which one came from what and then if you remember which one came from what, you can remember, oh, this one's orthogonally based and this one's diagonally based. Anyways, we finally made it through all the pieces. So thanks for sticking around. We're not done yet. We still have a second video where we'll go over more of the complex rules, which mainly involve the lion movement, as well as basic tips for getting started in Chushogi. So I'll catch you in the next video.